Welcome to this course on macroeconomic modeling for sustainable development. This is the presentation of the second lesson of the first module of the course. The course, of course, is part of the Young Economist Network established by the Economic Commission for Africa and particularly EDEP. The topic for this lesson has to do with the ISLM model, a review of that model, and a focus on the role that this model plays or can play in planning and policy in uh, our African countries, particularly to take a look at the policy implications of this model if it were to be used in terms of decision making by policy makers. So let us go forward with this one. The ISLM model draws from a Keynesian perspective of the economy. And from that perspective, we represent the goods market as essentially, at least from the beginning, and we will see what complications can come up later. But for now, we will consider the economy as a closed economy in which output and therefore income is determined by expenditure. Again, it's a, it's a purely Keynesian perspective and it is represented on what's known as the Keynesian cross. So in terms of notation, we are going to uh, use I for planned investment. We are going to use PE for planned expenditure and PE will be equal to consumption plus investment plus government. Notice here that we don't have net export. The reason being that we started with the assumption that the economy is a closed economy. So therefore, in this uh, simplified perspective of the economy and staying on the demand side, okay, uh, we will have that expenditure would be equal to uh, the consumption engaged in by households, investment engaged in by firms, and government expenditure. And of course, uh, at equilibrium in this perspective, the real GDP or output or income will be set to be equal to actual expenditure in that model. Okay, that's on the goods market side. On the money market side, the Keynesian view is essentially based on the theory of liquidity preference. So what is the theory of liquidity preference? What it says essentially is that the interest rate in the economy is determined by uh, the interplay between money supply and money demand. Okay, again, liquidity preference theory. The interest rate is determined by the interplay between money supply and money demand. So if we use M for money supply uh, with the understanding that the supply of money is determined by the central bank, and we use L for money demand, and in this case, we will assume that L is a function of interest rate and income, and the price level uh, will be assumed to be fixed in this analysis. Okay, those are some of these assumptions are things that can be uh, modified in uh, later iterations of this model and, and look at what the uh, effects of those modifications might be. But for the moment, these are the assumptions that we are making. Under those assumptions, uh, 
then here's what happened in terms of precisely representing uh, our different C is modeled to be a function of disposable in function of disposable income that you pay. So Y minus T, okay? So consumption is a function of Y minus T, that's disposable income. We will assume for the moment, right, that uh, government uh, has a set amount of expenditures that it engages on, that can change. Uh, we will assume that taxes are essentially exogenous for the moment, and uh, a, a, a bigger assumption, a major assumption, is that for the moment, that investment would be considered exogenous. This, again, would be something that we will change uh, later on and see what the effect would be. And so under those assumptions, expenditure then, your planned expenditure would be equal disposable income plus uh, investment, which is considered to be exogenous for now, and plus government expenditure, again, considered to be exogenous. So the bar on each of the variables means that for the moment, in this discussion, they are considered to be exogenous. At equilibrium, at equilibrium, actual expenditures are considered to be equal to planned expenditure. So Y is equal to PE, meaning that, right, uh, not only are going, uh, actual expenditure is considered to be equal to planned expenditure, but the, therefore from that, right, from that income or output is considered to be equal to uh, planned expenditure as well. So this we can represent uh, uh, along what's known as the Keynesian cross. On the vertical axis, you have Y, which stands for income uh, and also output. Income is, is, we are using income and output interchangeably in this discussion. So, okay, you, you notice that it doesn't start with zero. It, it doesn't start at zero. It starts above zero. Essentially what this means, the reason the PE line starts above zero is because uh, if you consider that you are in a situation where you have absolutely no income, right? Let's, let's consider such a situation. What you still have to live, you still have to eat. Um, we can we can look it at it look at it that way, or we can look at it in terms of uh, the uh, different age brackets that a person goes through, right? So let's say from the time you are born to the time you are eighteen. Let's just say you are not making any money, right? You are not yet an adult. You're not supposed to work yet. Yet, you have uh, you have to eat. You are eating. You are uh, you are wearing clothes. You are going to school. You are going to the doctors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, when you look at it, uh, even when income is zero, it doesn't mean that consumption is zero, right? It doesn't mean that planned expenditure. Uh, uh, equal to zero. So therefore, the line, the Keynesian cross starts at a point above zero. Now you can see it slopes, right? Uh, to the right, and that slope is determined by what's known as the marginal propensity to consume. The marginal propensity to consume, the MPC, okay? So the slope of 
the Keynesian cross is determined by the marginal propensity to consume, okay? So that is uh, the representation. And what is the marginal propensity to consume? Let me uh, spend a, a minute on that. The marginal propensity to consume is equal to the amount of change that occurs in consumption when income goes up by one unit. So for example, suppose that your, uh, you earn $100 more than the time before, right? Your income has gone up by $100, okay? And suppose that out of the $100-esque income that you earn, suppose that you consume $80, eight zero. Suppose that you consume $80 out of the $100. So what does that mean? It means that your marginal propensity to consume, right, is, is what? 80%. Because out of 100, you are consuming, you are spending $80, which means that you save, because what do you do with the 20% left, right? The $20 that's left. So that one you save. So in that situation, in that example, we would say that the marginal propensity to consume is equal to 80% or 0.8 if you like, and the marginal propensity to save automatically, if you know that the marginal propensity to consume is equal to 0.8, then automatically the marginal propensity to save is equal to 0.2 because uh, it is equal to one minus the marginal propensity to consume. They, the both of them must be equal to one when you add them up. Let me recapitulate this because it's important a bit. As a household, you make income. You make income, you pay taxes. That is that you must, uh, you are only able to consume the after-tax income, what we call disposable income. So now you have the disposable income. In your disposable income, there are essentially two things you can do. You can consume it or you can save it, okay? So the amount, the proportion of that income, that disposable income that you consume, that you spend on consumption is known as the marginal propensity to consume, propensity to consume. And the proportion that you save is known as the marginal propensity to save. And if I take the marginal propensity to consume plus the marginal propensity to save, they must be equal to one, okay? Now, the equilibrium condition in this model, right? So we will consider a 45 degree line. Along that line, every, day, every point along that line is a point where planned expenditure is equal to output along the 45 degree line, okay? So the cross that we've been talking about is occurring, right, at a point like the PE line, the actual is equal to the line of equality between the planned expenditure and income. So your equilibrium income occurs at that cross where the two lines cross, which determines, of course, the, uh, expend, the actual expenditure, et cetera. So that is the, the, what we, are, what we call the Keynesian cross, traditionally speaking. Now, in that realm, uh, we are going to see what happens when there's an increase 
in uh, things that we were holding fixed, right? So let's say government goes and spend more money than it was doing before, increase in gov now because of COVID. So a lot of governments throughout the world, right, are uh, spending extra amount of money in terms of subsidies, in terms of further investment, uh, in order to uh, face the, the effects of COVID on uh, individuals, on communities, on society, on uh, firms, etc. So there's a lot of uh, extra expenditures going on, right? Uh, as we speak in many of our countries uh, and also in the world. So let us start with a, a level of expenditure we are going to call G1. And suppose that there's an increase in government expenditure to G2. What happens is that the line shifts parallel, shift up, right, to the red line. It's a parallel shift. And the difference, the height of the shift is equal to the change in government expenditure, all right? In this representation of the model. <clears throat> so uh, what happens? Well, because of the uh, increase in G, uh, the economy will not be able to stay at Y1 anymore, right? Because at Y1, there's a non-planned drop in inventory. More is needed, more spending was happening in the economy. So inventories drop. And because of that, firms would inc by increasing output, the, uh, the GDP, the income, new equilibrium at Y2. So this shows uh, in this uh, representation that an increase in government expenditure uh, results in a higher level of output for the economy. From a Keynesian perspective, this assumes nothing else is increasing or changing. This is known as a Sitteris Paribus analysis. So in terms of uh, a, 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 the mathematical representation of what we just said, uh, suppose we begin with an equilibrium condition, right? Where Y is equal to C plus I plus G, consumption, investment, government. Again, let me remind you that uh, the economy is assumed to be closed for now. So there's no uh, external sector. There's no export, there's no import in this uh, uh, simplified economy. So Delta will be used as a, a representing changes. So change in, in Y would be equal to change in C plus change in I plus change in G, right? So Delta would be how we represent changes in this, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, perspective, from this perspective. So uh, if output is changing, uh, it must be due to something. It must be due to either there's a change in uh, consumption or there's a change in investment, or there's a change in, in the government expenditure, or all of that going on at the same time, possibly, okay? And now, because uh, if you hold for the first iteration, this again will change, uh, uh, we are simplifying. If we hold by assumption, in this example, uh, investment to be exogenous, then we can simplify the model to be equal to, uh, to, to say the following, that the change in Y is equal to uh, the marginal propensity to consume times Y plus the change in G, okay? change in C, the reason that is the case is because the change in consumption, as I said, you, I said to you before, the change in consumption is equal to the marginal propensity consumed times 
your change in income. Remember, I gave the example. If you get an extra income of $100, right? And then I say, your margin of propensity to consume is 0.8, right? Then I ask you, how much was the change in consumption? Well, what you do is you multiply 0.8 times 100, and that will give you $80. So uh, the change in consumption in our example can be substituted to be the marginal propensity to consume times the change in output or the change in income. Of course, uh, G, the change in G is still there. So when we put all of this together, okay, then you get the, uh, that last equation that one minus, remember there's a change of Y in, on the left-hand side, and there's also a change in Y on the right-hand side. So you need to, when we put them together, you collect the terms, then one minus the marginal propensity consume times the change in income is equal to the change in G. Okay, so you can see why for the moment we held, uh, uh, we held uh, uh, investment the exogenous, right? It's a ceteris paribus paris assumption. Okay? Right. So one minus the marginal propensity to consume times the change in income is equal to the change in uh, government expenditure. And that is how you can find how much income has changed as a reaction to an increase or a change in government expenditure. In the Keynesian uh, perspective, the change in income is equal to one over one minus the marginal propensity to consume times, times the change in government or any other very particular model. So for example, right? Suppose that um, your, if your, um, uh, marginal propensity to consume uh, is equal to uh, 0.8, for example, right? So suppose that the marginal propensity to consume is equal to 0.8, then uh, the one minus 0.8 would be equal to what? Minus two, and therefore uh, you are going to have that the uh, one, over one minus two would be equal to five. Again, let me repeat that. If the margin of propensity consume, for example, is 0.8, then the one over one minus 0.8 is five, okay? That is going to tell you, in my simple example, setting the margin of propensity consumed at 0.8, it is telling you that when government changes expenditure, income changes by five times the original change in government expenditure. That's what it means, that income changes by five times. This is known as the expenditure multiplier the one over one minus uh, MPC is known as the expenditure multiplier, okay? So this is the example I was giving, right? So suppose that the increase in uh, uh, income, what is the increase in income that would result from a $1 increase in government expenditure, okay? Again, the one over one minus the marginal propensity to consume is known as expenditure multiplier. And how do I calculate it? If I set the marginal propensity to consume to 0.8, then 
the expenditure multiplier is equal to five, which means that in this simple example, with nothing else going on in the economy, with Secretary Paribus' assumption that if government increases its expenditure by $1, what it means is that income goes up by $5, okay? The government expenditure multiplier, all right? So this is something to, to keep in mind uh, because of course in reality, in the real world, uh, there are other things, other forces that are happening at the same time. You cannot hold Ceteris Paribus, but what it does say is that even if uh, everything else is happening, that in general, when government injects some money into the economy, that it will have an effect at the end of it, it will have an effect that's going to be multiple times what was. And so uh, how do we explain that in our model? Right. Remember, uh, uh, in our uh, simple uh, equation for income, income is equal to C plus I, even if I is exogenous, investment is exogenous, plus G, government expenditure, in that closed economy, right, that we started with, okay? So what happens when income goes up? Okay, remember your consumption is a function of disposable income. So when income goes up, well, immediately your consumption goes up in our model. But, right, your consumption goes up, that also increases income because income is equal to C plus I plus G. So if income goes up, leading to consumption going up, but in return, the increase in consumption further increases your income. And the cycle continues, right? The increase in your income further increases consumption and increase in consumption increases income again, uh, but, in order for us, for the system not to explode, right? The marginal propensity to consume is less than one, which it cannot be greater than one, otherwise the system will explode, right? So it's less than one. And so each time, each iteration, right? Uh, of this cycle, uh, the change at each further step is less than the step before, okay? So yes, it goes up, the income goes up, consumption goes up, then income goes up again, then consumption goes up, it causes income to go up again, but each time, each time, uh, the changes, the increases, okay, uh, get smaller and smaller and smaller. So what the accumulated effects, the multiplier effect. And so the final impact on income turns out to be much bigger than the initial uh, change in government expenditure. And that is what we call the multiplier effect. Okay, now suppose, let's look at the same thing from uh, a tax perspective. Okay, by the way, by the way, when I talk about government expenditure or taxes, it will come to that. This is a fiscal policy, remember, right? This is fiscal policy, so, so uh, but we'll come to policy. For now, we are playing, for the moment, playing with the, uh, uh, we're playing really with the uh, equations, with the models, okay? Uh, and see how mathematically we can, uh, you know, solve for, uh, different equilibrium conditions based on changes uh, going on inside the body. So right now, uh, let's see what the impact of the change in taxes, okay? Remember that the original equilibrium condition is that 
uh, y is equal to c plus i plus g. We have all already said that changes in y would be an accumulation of changes in consumption, investment, and also government expenditure, okay? Let's suppose in our example now, this new example where we are focusing on taxes, let's keep investment and government expenditure fixed. Let's keep them fixed. They are not changing, ceteris paribus. The only thing that will be changing because you are changing taxes, the only thing that will be changing will be consumption. Remember, consumption is a function of disposable income. And disposable income is income minus taxes, right? So given that we are holding ING exogenous, what happens is that we are going to now substitute, remember the marginal propensity to consume, okay, into the equation. That, so change in C will be equal to the marginal propensity consumed times the change in disposable income. And what is the change in disposable income? Well, it is the change in income minus the change in taxes. All right. So solving for Y, so the, the one minus the marginal propensity consumed, again, you collect the terms, times the change in Y is equal to what's left over which, which is on the other side, I mean, is the minus marginal propensity to consume times the change in taxes. And, and think, think about this even here, okay? You have a minus on the right-hand side. Uh, if you think about it, what he's saying is that when taxes go up, you consume less. But that's what he say, he's telling you already, okay? That's what he's telling you already. The, so the final result is that the change in income, right? Change in income, change in output, change in GDP, these are all the same uh, uh, thing, uh, would be equal to uh, minus the margin of propensity to consume now. Remember before it was one on the numerator, but now it is a negative margin of propensity to consume divided by one minus the margin of propensity to consume times the original change in taxes. Taxes cause consumption to reduce. And when consumption goes down, output also goes down. If you recall in the first lesson, we gave an example from the United States of the components of the GDP. And if you remember from that lesson, for the case of the GDP for the United States, consumption occupies 70%, a full 70% in 2004. It was, a, it was data from 2004, et cetera. But really, if you look at the rest of the world, it turns out that it's a consumption is around that number. Uh, okay, the, the, the weight of consumption, the weight of consumption in national income. And so when you raise taxes, this is what it means, right? It would cause consumption to go down because raising taxes means disposable income will go down. And if consumption is going down, income goes down as well. Again, let's see uh, with a numerical example, uh, let's say a $1 in increase in taxes, uh, you see the tax multiplier there, right? Negative uh, MPC, the marginal propensity to consume uh, by one minus, uh, divided by one minus uh, MPC. So if the marginal to consume is equal to 0.8, then of course the tax multiplier is equal to negative four. You just 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 replace MPC by 0.8 in that equation, so then it becomes negative four. What does that mean? Well, it means that uh, if you increase taxes, if the government that increases taxes by term, uh, I mean, output or income, 
goes down by four times the change in taxes. If you increase taxes in this example by a dollar, okay, income goes down by four dollars. That's what it means. All right. So that is known as the tax multiplier. Okay. The difference, there, there's a, a few differences, at least two differences in this simplified version of the model between the uh, expenditure multiplier and the tax multiplier. One is that um, the expenditure multiplier is positive, right? Uh, uh, whereas the, the tax multiplier is negative, okay? Uh, but the other one is because you have the uh, MPC in the numerator that in absolute value, in absolute value, the expenditure multiplier is greater than the tax multiplier. Okay, this is absolute value. Okay, so 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 think about it. So for example, if you reduce taxes in this this model, if you reduce taxes instead of increasing, if you reduce taxes by a dollar, what I just said is that if you reduce taxes by a dollar, government reduces taxes by a dollar. In this example income will go will go up will go up if you reduce in taxes income will go up by four dollars okay but at the same time if government instead of reducing taxes were to cause uh government expenditure to go up by a dollar then of course income would go up as we saw it before by five dollars assuming in both cases that the margin of profits to consume is 0.8 Okay, so that is uh, the um, uh, uh, how you work out right the impacts of changes in this Keynesian perspective of the economy, right? So if you recap, uh, in this case, with the economy being closed, uh, government expenditure uh, can result in an expansion of output and increases in taxes will result in a reduction uh, in output. And the size of the expansion or the size of the reduction in both cases uh, is a function of the marginal propensity to consume. Okay. Now, uh, Remember, we began this lesson by talking about the ISLM curve. So what are those? Okay, the ISLM model. So what we have done so far is sort of preliminary, uh, right, uh, presentation of the modeling realm in which the ISM, ISLM model Will be uh, will be developed. Okay, so the IS is known uh, is investment savings. That's what IS stands for. So it represents combinations of real interest rate and real output. Okay, where equilibrium in the goods market is established. So a combination of real interest rate and real output where actual expenditure is equal to planned expenditure. Okay. So uh, of course, in this case, in that case, since we are uh, we are now in the world of interest rate and output, we can no longer assume that investment is exogenous because investment, if you remember investment is a function of at least the real interest rate, right? That's the cost of borrowing and investing, right? And, uh, and of course, also a function of, 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 uh, of income. Uh, and so investment changes uh, as a result of changes in, in, in R, and therefore, right, my R here is real interest rate, 
right? So therefore, we can no longer assume uh, when I'm trying to draw the IS curve that investment is exogenous. And so uh, what you would see is that, uh, of course, uh, increases in real interest rate will result in reduction in output. And therefore, the IS curve is negatively sloped. Okay, the IS curve is negatively sloped. And this is how you determine the IS curve. This equation is, is here. Uh, you have now my uh, consumption, which is a function of disposable income, right? You have uh, the uh, combination of consumption and investment and government, right? That is output. But now, investment, instead of considering investment to be exogenous, investment would be considered to be a function of the real interest rate, a function of the real interest rate. And so when I uh, derive uh, mathematically, you can prove this for yourself, when I derive mathematically uh, the uh, equation for output, okay, it gives you this equation, which is a function of the real interest rate. This is known as the IS equation. And vision, you have what's known as the autonomous consumption. Remember, I told you, even if you're not making any money at all, you still have to consume. That's autonomous consumption. Uh, if or nothing, there's still some, going to be some investment in the economy somehow because we are living. So there, there's going to be some autonomous uh, investment, part of investment at the economy. Okay, and then of course government uh, is there, and of course you see here that taxes are also included. Notice that the small b is the marginal propensity to consume. So what do you see? You the example that we worked out before is is uh, represented here. The two examples are represented here. Right, one over one minus B, right? That is the one over one minus the MPC, and minus B over one minus B. You remember was the negative MPC over one minus MPC, which is the, uh, the um, tax multiplier. So you have the expenditure multiplier represented, you have the tax multiplier. But now, because uh, investment is now fully modeled as a function of real interest rate. Okay. So that it, the, what you need to get out, it has a negative input, has a negative relationship with the real interest The equilibrium uh, uh, condition in the money market, it says what obviously, we remember we assumed that the uh, money supply is uh, determined by the central bank. 